So one more panel from PaizoCon, and we're going to be covering Pathfinder Adventures. This is basically all the adventure paths and standalone adventures that are going to be coming out over the next year or so. And there are quite a few to cover, so I'm pretty happy to go over them. My name is Don. I'm trying to be the Sly Strategist, and let's go ahead and get into it. So we started off with Stolen Fate. It is currently in mid-release, and the point of it is protecting fate itself. Basically, bad actors and troublemakers have figured out how to use a powerful deck of magic cards, and they're using it to try and build their own future, custom tailored to what they want, but you don't want that to happen. Four cards mysteriously show up in your belongings one day, and from there, you have to basically track down all 54 of the cards in the Harrow deck, and they're scattered all over the place. Here's a, one of the pictures they showed where Someone is trying to snatch the cards out of your hands while you're fighting an astral demon. It is a three-parter. It is an adventure path for characters level 11 to 20th. The first one is called The Choosing. It's already out by Ron Lundeen. The second one is by Chris Sims called Destiny War. And the third part is The Worst of All Possible Worlds, and it's the finale. Now, one of the fun things about this one is at the end of that particular adventure, you have defeated the whole plot and gotten all these cards, and you may be able to do a powerful divination and maybe find out some hints about what's coming for Valerion. They kind of tease that there's a paragraph that stealthily broadcasts some of the upcoming storylines and lore books that are going to be coming out. So that should be a really interesting one once we get to that third volume of Stolen Fate. It's a high-level adventure path, once again starting at 11, that goes all over the place, different planes, different demi-planes. You have a demi-plane hangout that you can construct. They have a new Harrow deck, and we'll go ahead and show a picture of that, that he kind of held up to the camera, so they aren't the best, but it does have a magnetic clasp on the case that, uh, very helpful in Stolen Fate. Each card is a magic item, and you can have up to five of these cards. By using the cards in this deck, it's very easy to track what items you might have from it on your character because you have the physical cards. Then they showed a bunch of cards, up to seven of them, and we'll kind of go ahead and cycle through those as I'm talking about it. But it is, and the cards themselves are a very fun sort of tactile way to build in plots and, and things of that nature. You can use this for other adventures as it is pretty much just a fun little subsystem. Uh, they brought up a case where they put it into the first adventure where you can use the hero cards as a sort of stand-in for hero points. And one of the things that did come up in chat was that the hero deck, if you pre-ordered it, which I did, it's been delayed due to issues with construction of the box, not the cards themselves. So they are a little bit delayed. Next, we went into the Enmity Cycle. Go ahead and show that picture there. This particular adventure path came about because we often hear about the Sun Orchid Elixir anytime you talk about Buvia. And Buvia, is a, there's a lot more to it. It's a five city state that transfer around the sale of these Sun Orchid Elixirs and other things. They've had a complicated long history being stuck between Radum and Osirian. And all you really ever think about are Sun Orchid Elixirs and Alchemists. So this is a slice of life adventure. They picked one of their favorite cities, which was Lemasara, which is known for its arts and beauty and figured that it would be a fun place to put a nice little intrigue investigation type story. The basis of the plot is that three prominent artists go missing all of a sudden, and they were working on a big crazy project, which was their words, and they go missing. So one of the patrons reaches out to the player characters and gets them to track down what's going on. They said no spoilers, however, divs play a very prominent part and wanted to state that there is no Sun Orchid Elixir for you in it at the end. It was written by Brian Duckwitz. Then we talked a little bit more about the Sky King's Tomb, and we've heard a bit about that during PaizoCon, but it is a three-part adventure path that takes you from levels 1 through 10, and it starts you off in the Dorburn city of Highhelm and will take you deeper and deeper underground. There are fun tie-ins to some of the Lost Omen books, such as Lost Omen's Legends, as well as what is just about to be released, Lost Omen's High Home book, but also because it's really delving into Dorvan legend in a way that they haven't done before. 
and this is pretty much how they explained it. Doors have this thing where about 10,000 years ago, King Toreg gave them a prophecy that was when he sends a sign to everyone, they all have to go to the surface and all the Dorvan people say, okay, we got it. Then there was an earthquake and they thought, oh no, we should go to the surface. And it was called the quest for sky. It was a tragic time period. And during this time, the figure called Tarek or High King Tarek was really important in uniting the different Dorvan clans in order to keep everybody focused on getting to the surface and fulfilling the vision that he had for his people. Even though dwarves keep great records, they live a long time. Heck, they even write in stone sometimes. But 10,000 years is a long, long time, and that's a long time to forget things, lose records, and kind of mythologize. And so in the course of Sky King's Tomb, you're going to be learning some of this lost lore of what Target was really doing, what he was really about, and what the quest for Sky really involved. It opens up as you being various people that are invited to High Helm, sponsored by one of the High Helm's major Dorvan clans, Clan Tolar. And you were there as research guests or performance artists or just any number of other ways that you could be invited to a city. And they might even be interested in your own personal history. You are there hoping that you can help out and you're going to be uncovering bits of mystery and becoming more and more involved in it. But one of the key things they wanted to point out is that Sky King's Tomb is not solely a Dwarven adventure path. It has a lot of opportunities for other player characters to come in, other classes that you wouldn't normally play with a Dwarf other ancestries to come in, and just about any class can be played in this particular adventure path. So regardless of what your character is, there's a great way for you to get involved and to feel connected and really relevant to the storyline, whether your character is a dwarf or not. The first book is The Mantle of Gold, which is written by John Compton, adventure path number 193. The second one, adventure path 194, was Cult of the Cave Worm, written by Scott D. Young. And the final book, 195, is Heavy is the Crown, written by Jessica Catalan. There's also some familiar names. Because the Five Kings Mountain region is one of the earliest places that Lost Omen settings, that they really delve deep, and even goes back to one of the earliest player companion books, it had been visited several other times. One of the things they brought up is a dwarf named Zomar, and he is a Rivathun. You get to help Zomar, this Rivathun, with a little water elemental spirit, and we'll show that picture here. That is, the water elemental is in an amount of peril, and you get to help the spirit along and become friends with it, and get to see what being a Rivathun is all about firsthand, and the way that they treat spirits as equals, and respecting the natural sort of flow and order of things. Rivathun are an animus style dwarf that they believe everything is a spirit. The gods are spirit, the rock is a spirit, the river is a spirit, the mountain is a spirit, and Galarian is a spirit. And there's a hierarchy of spirits that we can see, and Zomar is one of these prominent Rivathuns that you get to meet and interact with him during the course of the adventure path and make some new friends along the way. Then there were some uh, quick monster cameos that took place. They kind of made it out to be inadvertent, but I think it was pretty obvious that they wanted to show them. But the first one I'll show here is Bloodseekers. Uh, they come in swarms. And they didn't really go too far into it, but they said you wouldn't want to be attacked by one, let alone a whole swarm. And then cave worms. The one that was shown was a glacial worm. There is also a crimson worm with fire and lava and a regular rock cave eating worms that bore out rock. One of the things that you learn is that they are not different species, but what they are is determined when it hatches as there is a specific thing that happens to determine what it is going to be. They wouldn't tell us what it is, but there's a huge ecology article about cave worms that are part of this particular adventure path. Then we move on to Seasons of Ghosts. Seasons of Ghosts, we'll show the picture here, takes us through September. It's a four part adventure path. The first time that they've done something with four parts and takes you from level one all the way up to 12th level. The scene we're showing here is a Fia and a Korake coming up against this mysterious ghostly barrier called the Wall of Ghosts, which is something you're going to run into a lot in this adventure path. It plays a key role in the campaign. It takes place entirely in the town, in a new town called Willowshore, 
which in itself is located in Shenmin. And this is kind of in the middle dead center of Tianzhou. Shenmin is the kind of place where Asian themed horror story content plays out. And it really is what this adventure path is about, is, is this horror type theme. Lots of ghosts, lots of spooky stuff. It'll be starting in October with the first volume called The Summer That Never Was. It's called The Seasons of Ghosts specifically because each one of these adventures takes place over the course of three months. So the four seasons, the entire adventure path will cover an entire year of play. And that's in part why it's going to be a far, four part adventure path. Begins with the player characters waking up after a festival that they may have gotten a little bit too festive, a little bit too drunk, and they stagger back to town and find out that some evil, strange, sinister curse is falling over the town of Willow Shore. Your player characters are going to be assumed that this is their hometown. The expectation of this entire adventure path is that you're playing characters who grew up local to the town. There's a pretty robust gazetteer about the location, telling you more about the theme and the style and part of what happens in the summer that never was. But you find out that there's something that's kind of keeping you stuck in this region. and You can't really go too far from Willow Shore. There's monsters all over the place, ghosts, yokai, kappa. I'm assuming this has something to do with that wall of ghosts we saw earlier. In the second module called Let the Leaves Fall, in this adventure, the player characters realize that they're kind of stranded in this town and they need to prepare for winter because they aren't going to be able to get reinforcements or resources, food, those kind of things. They learn more mysterious secrets that might be hidden in a monastery. There's a significant part of this adventure where you're walking up this path in the mountains to explore this old monastery, and the monastery will have support articles about the first long night, which is significant, that occurs mid-autumn, mid-fall festival that is pretty popular. So in that big article about the belief of what is reincarnation cycles, in the third module called No Breath to Cry, this one takes place in the winter time and the winter is the toughest season. So there's going to be a lot of, of struggle and a lot of stuff going on. And you're going to figure out, hopefully, what exactly is causing this situation to occur. This one has an article about a new kind of thing called Notaroos and they're associated with the corruption of the reincarnation cycle. They didn't give us too much more information about the Notaroos, because if they did, it would spoil a huge part of the adventure, so no spoiler. The fourth module is called Bloom Below the Web. This one kind of wraps up the entire storyline. Everything seems to be kind of back to normal, but you are kind of dealing with the consequences of what happens when everything goes back to normal, because there's repercussions. You have to start dealing with the Juraguma, which is the group that runs Shenmen the town and are now kind of getting involved in politics and all of those things associated with that. There will also be a Beyond the Campaign article at the end of it, and the article is about the horrors among us, which is kind of a urban legend and how they might impact and enhance your horror games and a little bit in the plot of the season. This particular module takes place, or this particular adventure path takes place only a couple years after the Age of Lost Omens. So this is not a modern Shenmin that you are playing this out in. You're playing this out in the shadow of the long wire that just collapsed. And the things like the Juroguma are just now kind of taking over Shenmin. This will wrap up in January. Kind of getting out of this monthly cycle later this year, Rust Henge will be coming out. It's a first to third level adventure. And here we see uh, Lenny, which I'll go ahead and show that picture, which is fighting sort of these weird fungus type things. They come from the abyss and they get into animals and then they become gross off that animal. But the basis for this particular adventure path is you are a member of this town called Osprey Bay that was founded by a bunch of escaped prisoners and such from Riddleport. They hijacked a ship and found a place to live, led by these two siblings, a brother and sister, and they established a town called Osprey Bay. Years later, the brother decides that it's a little bit too communal, kind of a little bit too hippie for him, and he's going to establish his own better town just down the shore called Iron Harbor. His thought was because we're Goramites and we think Gorm is cool, and so there's this rivalry sort of between these two towns. Well, you get to be a PC, as someone who grew up in Osprey Bay or is visiting, and you get commissioned to go find out about the strange happenings in Iron Harbor. 
One of the notable things that happens is there is a Thunderhead Isle. It's an island just off the coast, but it has a really strange old structure on it that people think is haunted. There's seven giant twisted metal spires that reach into the sky, and sailors typically try to stay away from it. But for some reason, some Iron Harbor folks moved over there to these ruins and kind of took over that aisle. And you get to go over there and find out what's going on that's troubling Iron Harbor. And not only stop the evil, terrible plot, but help reestablish relations between these two towns that have been at odds for such a long time. It has some investigation, a lot of good role play hooks into it. There is some dungeon crawling through old Thessalonian ruins, but it is going to be a good one for first through third level player characters as sort of an introductory adventure or for long-term players who just want to do some exploring. It has some shared DNA with Malevolence, which is an adventure from a few years ago. It would be a good starting point for folks that are new to Pathfinder. Second edition, the encounters skew less difficult overall, but there are a few severe encounters, but most of them are going to be low or moderate and a couple trivial, so people can just kind of get their feet wet. But they did say there are still some horrible, terrifying things to curse your players with. There is no adventure path or adventure content coming out in February because in March there is a 200 page adventure path called Seven Dooms for Sandpoint, and we'll show that cover. It's gonna be a 200 page soft cover and a 200 page hard cover with an alternate cover that you can get. And in this particular picture, one of the dooms is kind of happening, not necessarily what will happen, but if you mess up a little bit, this could be what happens to Sandpoint. They brought up a Anchor the Gas Alchemist. As one of the conspirators manipulating events behind the scenes, he is not a friendly guy. And the next picture they showed, rather than just one of the dooms, they showed a bunch of them, four of them actually. And they're kind of lined up. It's probably an encounter that's an extreme encounter for any levels in this group. You start at fourth level and will go to 11th. And if you do everything in the campaign, you will probably make it to 12th level for a few of the final encounters. It is sort of a sequel to Burnt Offerings, which was AP number one in that it starts with a solar Xantus, who's a local cleric. So in Burnt Offerings, there was something that happened that he feels guilty about and shame for how Sandpoint treated a woman, Dua Leah, who was an Azamar who grew up in town and everybody just kind of treated her awfully because she was a beautiful woman, but people used to rub her hair for good luck and do some odd things to her. She was adopted by her father, who was a previous priest in town who was overprotective and she had a bunch of awful things happened to her in Burnt Offerings, which made her the main villain of that adventure. Solar Xantos is looking to use a call spirit spell to contact Dualia's spirit and basically he wants to apologize to her and to apologize for Sandpoint. But when he goes to cast this spirit ritual, he realizes he needs a part of her body, a physical part of her body. So he exhumes her corpse to find out that there is no corpse, but there is a tunnel that goes down underground. And that's when you realize that they need help. So they call in the player characters in order to explore and find out what's going on below her grave. Now, part of the theme of Sandpoint is that it's kind of like a down on the luck conspiracy type place. From the very start, there is being attacked by goblins and then by a dragon, tsunamis, and all these disasters and creatures that keep attacking the town. And we find out there's a reason why all this is going on. And this adventure path is about the player characters discovering that reason and hopefully putting the whole conspiracy that has been festering in this backwater. So people who have read Burnt Offerings or have played the Sandpoint software will know a lot of the basic elements of this adventure path as far as lore and the history. So there are going to be spoilers from that if you had played that or read those before. But this is a mega dungeon like Abomination Vault. You have to go back to town all the time as you progress, but there will be more coming for this particular adventure path at Gen Con. So a little bit, they came up with a little bit of a spoiler because someone thought that one of those was the Red Mantis and it's not. But down at the bottom, you have a Goblin Grave Knight. At the top, you've got the Sandpoint Devil. At the left, you got a ghoul alchemist, Coldus of Cabri. And on the right, you have the Red Bishop, which is a Mothman cultist of Asuzu. Now, the title is Seven Dooms for Sandpoint, but there's only four characters here. So there's three other ones that you're going to have to kind of find out who they are and what they are. I hope you like this little summary of the Pathfinder adventures. There's a bunch of things coming out. Over the next few months, all the way into next year, a bunch to look forward to. And I hope 
that this kind of whetted your appetite a little bit for it. More information will be coming out at Gen Con, and I know I'm looking forward to that. So I hope you like this video. And if you did, feel free to like, subscribe, or hit that notification bell. But whatever you do, I hope you have a great day and happy adventuring. Thanks.